on advanced argumentation today. The reason we picked this very broad label was because it can sort of mean anything because there's a lot of people who have lots of different questions from the local circuit. So I want to accommodate them as much as possible. In the broadest possible sense, what we'll be looking at are argumentative techniques that I think are not well enough used or in any case, not enough used in many parts of the world. And we'll cover those. But having said that, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to just make yourself audible and ask the question. You don't necessarily have to put it in the chat. Like I'm very happy with you just interrupting me. And if I'm going too slow, if I'm going too quickly, obviously those are things that you can point out. Yep, I think that's enough housekeeping, but again, feel free to jump in. So I want to start with something very, very basic, but I think isn't done enough in debates. And that's the idea of analysis at the level of the actor. So usually speaking, when people analyze debates, they analyze them at this level. And this level usually means something like if a motion is, I know this house believes that Israel should, uh, I know, or should not, depends on the day, build settlements or something. Then the analysis would be um, at the level of Israel. So it would be something along the lines of, um, you know, good for them, bad for them, etc. Now, I think that this is very limited argumentative debating. And I've made this point sometimes elsewhere as well, that you need to do two different things, which are sort of stay away from this. So one is analysis. What you're doing is that you are breaking down the actor into different sub actors. So for instance, what this would look like is Israel becomes, you know, a conglomeration of the urban left, the conservative religious right, um, ultra orthodox Jews, uh, local Arabs living there. Um, and then similarly, like, you know, what does Likud think about this, which is the ruling party? What does the red and blue coalition think about this, which is like sort of a different party, all of those things. So what this means then is that you're not talking about Israel holistically. What you're doing is that you're talking about Israel within the context of the things which make up Israel. And then it becomes more interesting to debate this. So for instance, uh, if the motion is, you know, is it's good for Israel to not build settlements anymore, whatever, instead of being like, you know, this is generically good or bad for Israel, you're like, we're going to analyze the incentives or six or seven actors in this debate and systematically show to you how all of these groups benefit by settlements not being built. And if you do it in that context, then it becomes much easier to win the debate because you're compounding your analysis, right? Like it's a lot more things to say about a lot more people. But then the second thing that really helps here is not just amount of analysis, it's also being more precise in your claims argumentatively. So for instance, if you say this is good for Israel or bad for Israel or whatever, the problem with this is that you can't make a very strong moral claim. But what if you make a moral claim about um, local Arabs living in Israel, where you can say, you know, the 3 million Arabs who currently live within the confines of Israel, if you start building new settlements, don't build new settlements, these are the people who are most vulnerable in the region, so they need to be protected. So another thing that you can now play around with is that when you have six or seven different sub actors, you can choose how precise you are towards one, which actor is more morally worthy of our concern, all of those things. So you just have a lot more content to work with. So I would heavily suggest this. The one thing I would make very clear now is that this doesn't just apply to countries or governments. It also applies to like companies, for instance. So with companies, you know, like it can't, it doesn't just have to be Microsoft did this, that. Microsoft holistically, you know, is made up of like workers within that, you know, upper level versus like lower level hierarchy workers. And then there's like researchers, they are um, foreign, foreign workers, they are financial stakeholders, all of that stuff. So lots of ways in which you can do this with Microsoft as well. I, another example I often use is that you can often do this with social movements as well. So for instance, like, you know, Black Lives Matter. Okay, no, let's take something. I'm, I'm just going to take like local examples from now on because then it's difficult. Um, what's the local example? 
okay, let's take like a local student group, like a student action committee or something, right? Like they're not just made up of uh, in Pakistan of like, you know, just student action committee people. There's different people within them, right? So there'll be people from elite institutions, non-elite institutions. There'll be, you know, uh, women in there, men in there. There'll be non-binary people in there. There'll be like uh, people from Punjab, which unfortunately often happens to be the case, but there will also be representation from a uh, periphery area, so-called, you know, people who have different lived experiences of being a student, all of that stuff. So even within the student action committee in Pakistan, there's so many different actors who are doing different things. And all of them have different incentives to get into the committee. All of them have different incentives to keep fighting for the struggle. All of them have different incentives why they will stay or leave. So always remember that like this sort of analysis below the level of the actor can be applied to a bunch of different actors. It doesn't necessarily just have to be a uh specifically a country or a government are there any questions so far about this before i do the flip of this sort of the opposite of this any questions okay it's either going that well or that badly let's do analysis above the level of the actor so this is also like now should be intuitive right so like for instance, in the Israel motion, Israel itself is made up of uh, a system, right? So for instance, um, Israel is in the Middle East. So if there's an argument about how this threatens Middle East instability, you should probably make it here. Israel also happens to be uh, close to Iran, close to Saudi Arabia, um, close to a bunch of different places like uh, Lebanon, Jordan, the list goes on. But the point is, well, how are these countries impacted? The point at which Israel starts building or doesn't build settlements, right? Um, but then not just that, if further on, Israel is part of the international system. So for instance, if this increases the threat of a nuclear confrontation between Iran and Israel 10 years down the line, then that impacts international security. So what you're doing here is again, trying to find analysis, which fits above the level of the actor as opposed to below. Whereas this was all about breaking down the actor into different sub actors. What you're doing here is sort of the opposite, which is you're taking this actor technically as a sub actor and then going above and beyond to find different argumentation there. Generally speaking, um, you can also do this for other things. So like very similarly with companies, you can be like, you know, um, the financial system impacts if Microsoft does something, the global uh, development impacts if Microsoft does something, instead of just talking about like, you know, things within Microsoft or Microsoft itself. And then finally, with, with social movements, you can do the same thing. So like taking the same example of the student action committee, you could say that like, you know, anything that they do can like, you know, inspire social movements, in other regions within Pakistan or abroad, elsewhere in South Asia or something. Um, so, so again, what you're doing here is again, going above the level of the actor. Instead of only talking about the level of the actor um, at the level of the actor, you try to break them down and then try to bring them up. And that's how you find a lot more argumentative analysis than you would otherwise. Are there any questions about this so far at all? This entire thing that we've talked about. Anyone? One second. Let me check. I think that's like, a... okay, great. Let's move on. Um, let's talk about the next thing which is equally important. So I, okay, so let's start very simple. So there's this thing called a correspondence theorem in uh, mathematics. I think Leibniz came up with it or something. And it's very simple, which in all it says is like, you know, if whatever makes X, well, X is the same thing that makes Y, Y, then, X is like, you know, I'm using loose language here, basically the same as Y. I 
I think this is important in debates and it's often missed that we often define our terms through description as opposed to through outcomes. So what does that mean? And how does this impact debating? Um, think about this. Think about the fact that like whenever there's a debate about the US, you know, in, or, or like any other country, big country, invading, intervening in small country, which is like, you know, a lot of the international relations debate topics which come up. One of the things that often happens in these debate is uh, that there's a strange hierarchy. So the hierarchy goes something along the lines of first, we should try diplomacy, then we should try, uh, you know, harsh diplomacy or whatever it is. Um, then we should try economic sanctions. And, you know, finally, last resort, we go in with the guns, right? Like this is sort of like uh, the sort of orthodoxy within which I've seen a lot of IR debates take place. Um, the, the, the problem with this, and I want to focus specifically on the economic sanctions and uh, military intervention bit, is that they, this assumes that military intervention is different from economic sanctions. Now you would say, uh, obviously, because you know one of them is about shooting people and then the other is about setting up a trade embargo or something. But again, they're different in terms of the description of the process, but do we really care about that in debates unless you're making some sort of deontological argument? Like very rarely in debates do we care about the process by which outcomes occur. We often much more care about the outcomes themselves because of the sort of consequentialist bent in the global debating circuit. So then let's think about that. In terms of outcomes, is military intervention so much worse than economic sanctions? So for instance, um, the United Nations published this report, I think four or five years ago, where they basically talked about how, you know, over a hundred thousand Iraqi children had died as a direct result of US economic sanctions. And this had various to do with starvation, malnourishment, all of those horrible things, right? And when you think about this, the, like it sort of flips your intuitions about economic sanctions, doesn't it? Because you know you don't expect a hundred thousand kids to die because of sanctions in a way that you would be much less surprised to hear if it was in a war, like with the military intervention. Similarly, think about the fact that sanctions also threaten your sovereignty because now other countries control what you produce, sell, buy, um, uh, like basically everything else on many levels. Like short of you trying to make everything else in your country, your state sovereignty is now out of the window. They're basically controlling what your people are eating. They're basically controlling what your people are wearing. They're basically controlling what your people are driving, all of those things. So sanctions also sort of threaten your sovereignty. And then you can also argue that like, you know, sanctions disproportionately, just like with war, impact the poor while the rich escape. The point I'm trying to make here is that if the reason that military intervention is bad is that, you know, uh, military intervention bad because lots of people killed, plus violation of state sovereignty, then this is something that's also happening in the case of economic sanctions. Like they're happening in different ways and maybe even different scales, but they're both still happening. Like these are definitely very similar things, if not the same thing. And the reason I want you to think about this is because people often miss that you can flip arguments by thinking about not just why is military sanctions good, or why are economic sanctions bad, but sort of trying to equivalent them to be like, you know, there's an equivalence between the harm and benefit by sanctions and harm and benefits by military intervention. Other way, common example that I want to give you, because I think it will help, is the example of 
one second physical and mental harm so often there's in debating there's a distinction drawn here which is it sounds like you know physical harm worse than mental harm okay sure um you know sort of like makes sense in a first step sort of way where you're like you know if someone hits you in the head with a baton seems more painful than depression sort of thing but then how we how do we how do we flip this intuition because i think again if you think in terms of outcomes hard to draw a distinction between the two so what makes physical harm bad um physical harm is bad because well um it might impair your body in some way also happens because of mental harm um might lead to permanent damage also happens in the case of permanent harm of uh, uh, mental harm might lead to trauma also happens in the case of uh, mental harm so like if you start like going through the distinctions for or even the definitions of why physical harm is bad instead of thinking about the process which is you know the hit in the head with the baton versus depression like the processes are different but purely in terms of outcomes both seem very similar then mental harm should probably be put on the same pedestal of concern that physical harm is because they both seem to be equally bad because they're equally bad for the same reasons so i can keep doing this over and over but the general point is that this is really important you need to start equival uh, creating an equivalence between different arguments in terms of outcomes as opposed to in terms of processes and this will really help you strategically win in debates where you're defending the more extreme position when and then you're like wait what is the distinction here anyway we're both defending pretty much the same thing and then we can argue on the merits so it becomes a very easy way to win debates in that sense um between different things in terms of outcomes okay are there any questions about this one at all i actually can't check so someone will have to okay that's let's hope that's a good thing um let's move on the third thing i want to talk about in terms of like advanced argumentation <laughs> is uh use of empirical examples this is something i talked about recently elsewhere but i think it's really important it's just uh often there is a bias in debates towards okay no i have to start like simpler okay so so there's two sorts of reasoning in debating um the first is what most people would call logical or structural reasoning and then the second is what people would call factual or trivial reasoning so factual and trivial reasoning is a lot more about the what of things and logical and structural reason is much more about the why of things so for instance if you want to make a claim like um the the us should or i don't know the imf let's pick the imf the imf is a bad actor to pakistan the way that you would make the factual slash trivial reasoning is to say something like um imf's previous bailout to pakistan included terrible structural adjustment policies so you know which harmed pakistan's economy so this is again you're giving a, an example here essentially so you're explaining the what of things and then the more logical structural reasoning would be something along the lines of one second my computer has gone haywire would be something along the lines of why this is true so imf has incentives to hurt pakistan in order to for instance um uh, open up its borders to foreign 
multinational corporations um, to exploit the cheap labor it has um, to leverage against I don't know, China or something. So again, what you're doing here is that you're giving factual or trivial reasoning and then sort of explaining why that's the case is the logical or structural reasoning. Every claim on the planet should be made of these two reasons, which is A, the facts, B, the logical or structural reasoning. So I really hope that this is like something that you're already on board with because this is really important. I think I might have gotten a question. Is creating an equivalence different from proving why an argument isn't exclusive? Okay, that's actually a very interesting question. I, okay, so, 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 so Noor asks if everyone can see this, that is creating an equivalence different from proving why an argument isn't exclusive? No, I do think it's different because here the intention is not to wash the argument, right? So often what we do when we try to draw exclusivity is to say something like, you know, you're arguing that you have this good thing happening for you. We're going to argue we also have that good thing happening for us because it's happening for things which are nothing to do with the debate. So that's what, what you're trying to do there is to wash. The intention here is different and important, which is what you're trying to do here is lessen the extremity of your position. You know, military interventions are great uh, compared to economic sanctions. Um, you know, the psychological trauma as an argument is just as important as physical harm. Like in, in order for you to advance those sort of out of left field arguments, you need to make analysis which makes both arguments controversial. So again, it's, 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 it's sort of like in a very nuanced way, different from exclusivity. It's much more about sort of almost uh, reducing the controversy around your argument by showing that both arguments are equally controversial, if that makes sense. Does that make sense, Noor? Yeah, that does. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, okay, so often debates is a bias towards structural or logical reasoning. And, and the reason for this is obvious. So what will happen here is something along the lines of, uh, you know, PM will come up and the first speaker will come up and be like, um, I have an argument which has an example, right? And then OO or like leader of opposition will come up and then be like, yes, but I have a counter example. And at that point, like, you know, your example doesn't count for much anymore because the leader of opposition can say, I have a counter example, which proves otherwise, or leader of opposition can say, which is most often said, but it's the same theme of things, which is yes but that example is not representative so even if leader of opposition does not even have a counter example leader of opposition can come in and very validly say you know sure but this specific example that you're giving is not necessarily representative of the broader thing that we're talking about how do you fix this problem i think the problem is that a lot of debating i've noticed assumes that examples are inherently weak ways to uh, prove debates, but this is not true. In reality, the problem is with the sort of examples you're using. So the more constrained, I will explain what this means, within space and time, your facts and examples are, the weaker they are likely to be. And the more they capture across space and time, the stronger they are likely to be. So what does this look like in a debating context? Um, Let's say that you're having a debate and then um, someone comes in. Let's take the, in fact, the same argument. You know, PM comes in and says, IMF is a bad actor to Pakistan. And then the, the, the sort of factual or trivial reasoning that they're using here is to say something along the lines of, you know, what we said here, basically. IMF's previous bailout to Pakistan included 
la la la, and then you just put it here. Now, remember that leader of opposition can just come in and say something like, you know, oh, but what about this other bailout, or what about this example is not representative. So instead of using this specific fact, maybe an interesting thing to do would be to instead say, IMF has issued 17 bailout, uh, bailout programs in South Asia. None of them have ever been paid back. Paid back broad, more broadly of the 110 countries IMF has given money to, two have been able to pay back and the rest are in debt. Now, the importance of doing something like this is that this example is so immensely broad across space in the sense that, you know, geographically, and then also across time, which we'll get to in a second. What this means is that now they can't come in and say, this example is not representative of, you know, uh, the general reality or like, you know, I have a counter example because your example has so much factual immensity that it's impossible to sidestep this example. They now have to invest a lot of energy in rebutting this example. And they are now on the back foot. So always remember that what you are looking for are these sort of examples. You're looking for examples which are capture as much as possible across space and time. And a less nerdy way of saying this is simply, you are looking for trends and patterns is what you're looking for. So if you can find trends and patterns, for instance, this is a trend, this is a pattern, um, that's much more powerful as an example to use uh, than, you know, in 1993, when Benazir put, like, the, that doesn't necessarily matter, like, because they can just be like, in 1998, when the Oshrif was, and then, like, the counter example keeps happening. So, always in debates, try to find research and facts and empirical examples, which uh, capture as much as possible across space and time. And this will be true for anything. So, for instance, if, if you want to make an um, argument about how US is not a reliable actor to militarily intervene anywhere. You know, it has bad intentions, all of those things is a sort of argument you're trying to make. And then instead of using the example of, you know, um, look at what happened in Iraq, because the other side can come and say, you know, look at what happened I mean, this is debatable, but like, you know, look at what happened in Kosovo. So, you know, they'll be like, you know, sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad, you haven't proved anything here. But if you do something like, you know, um, over the last 120 years, the US has illegally intervened in the regime change of over 60 countries. Also happens to be true, by the way. So, you know, like once you say this, they, they can't come back with this, their singular example of Kosovo, right? And here, what you're doing is instead of going across space, which is what we're doing here, we're going across time. That there's a historical trend and pattern where the US continues to do this. So they can't come in and say that they're going to be any different now. Um, I hope that makes sense because this is a really important point in terms of using empirical examples. I do think there's a question though. Um, how do you sound more persuasive when making a factual claim or a trend, considering that judges can't fact check? Um, I mean, I would just, just as persuasive as you would sound when you're making a factual example. Does that make sense? So, that, so, like, so I don't intend for this to replace structural and logical reasoning, which will still be part of debating. It's more to replace really bad empirical examples used right now because they will consistently run into the problem of uh, you know being washed by a counter example or being shown that there is a representation or a generalization problem there so i think the question sort of assumes that you know uh, this is intended to replace this logical or structural reasoning but you would run into pretty much the same persuasive problems that you would using any examples and in this case you're just using an exponentially better example more generally though, whether you're using a limited example or a much broader example, in terms of sounding persuasive to judges about um, 
uh, your facts. Like it helps to be persuasive in the sense of being precise. So for instance, if you say like, you know, this is like, you know, when you ask your friend, like, have you seen that movie? Oh yes, uh, yes, with the with the hero. And yeah, that was, that was good. Like you can clearly tell they haven't seen the movie, but if you're like, uh, have you seen the movie? But they've read the Wikipedia page because they're sneaky like that. They'll be like, yes, John Cusack was fantastic in that. And the production value was 100 million. What a great movie. And then you're like, okay, maybe, maybe, maybe they've seen the movie. So similarly here as well, like precision and accuracy really helps because if you're like, you know, a World Bank report from 2015 pointed out that there were six different bailout packages given to, you know, Greece, Portugal, Ireland, Spain, Pakistan, Bangladesh, respectively. And this is what happened. It sounds so precise. It almost sounds hard to be made up. I know this sounds weird, but like, this is like a precision bias we all have, as opposed to you being vague with things. So that's like one tactic I would suggest for, you know, sounding more persuasive with your fact checks. Um, Okay, great. Wait, so, sorry, Tanya, was that a comment generally or was that a question? I'm confused by the punctuation of this, so. Um, I think it's a question that you can move on. Okay, okay. It's a question. Um, so examples showing a trend or behavior fact-based precise fact-based precise examples are better. Um, good question. So I think generally speaking in debates, uh, trends and patterns are much, much, much more useful than precise examples are. And this is actually sad, you know, because a lot of the culture behind debating around, for instance, prep motions in Pakistani debate tournaments is all about not just uh, university students, but specifically getting school kids to learn more about the world. So, so I think it's it's unfortunate that the activity rewards you know vague knowledge about general trends as opposed to very specific knowledge about specific things. But I think um, it is what it is, right? Like, and also like trends and patterns, knowing them isn't necessarily bad information either. So the short answer is unfortunately the activity generally tends to reward trends and patterns over. Uh, precise, very specific examples. I think I'll give you one case where that might not be the case. So for instance, um, let's just say that you're debating, um, let's just say that you're doing this, um, where is it? Yeah, so let's just say you're doing this, like this analysis below the level of the actor. Now in the analysis below the level of the actor, if you're gonna talk about how local Arabs in Israel are split over the settlement issue, depending on where they live in Jerusalem or Tel Aviv. This requires you to know things about Israel to a level at a level of precision, which requires you to research that much, right? So there will be sometimes cases where this precision and nuance helps. And this will usually be in the context of you really zeroing in on a very specific subgroup, subgroup, and then trying to find some nuance analysis there in closing, for instance. But outside of those cases, like I think trends and patterns still work. In fact, trends and patterns are a more economic way to research in the sense that, um, let's just say, so you know how like there's like unfortunately not enough debates about the African continent. People just throw out like, you know, countries like Africa in speeches because there's no nuance there, unfortunately. But think about it this way. Let's just say that you want to like, you know, make a matter file on the African continent or the European continent or the like, um, you know, the Asian continent. One way to do it is to now systematically read through the histories of like 50 different countries on the African continent or like, uh, you know, 35 different countries on the European continent. Another way to do it would be trends and patterns, right? So, you know, generally speaking on the African continent, what is the infant mortality rate trend? Generally speaking on the African continent, what is the trend of development aid inflows and outflows? What is the general trend towards democracy? Now, obviously the problem there is that there will always be nuance that you're missing, right? Because the difference between like Sudan and the Congo is probably all the difference in the world. But in a world where you can't have enough time to research, this trends and patterns things really helps because it helps you have a general feel for each part of the world as opposed to having very precise knowledge about one country and then trying to incorrectly apply it to other countries in the region, which I think is actually worse. So I hope that also answers the question. Um, 
I am not going to say this later on. So Tanya, how about you become audible and ask the question? Is that right? No, no problem to the other Tanya. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, sure. So I just wanted to ask, like, it's usually the case with like econ or IR motions that you have like a lot of like specific knowledge on that particular motion, or you know yeah. like so much about Middle East or like that particular I I I yeah. territory that you have like so much of that knowledge, but you don't exactly know how to exactly strategize in like when you're case prepping, but also like how to use that specific knowledge and like. Uh, in arguments or like how much do we need to say all of that information when you're contextualizing the debate as well so like how do you okay. prioritize that okay okay um I, okay so this is actually a surprisingly the uh, broad question but i think the way i will put it is something along the lines of think about it this way so if you so a good test in terms of knowledge is what bits of knowledge the judges absolutely need to know in order for my argument to make sense and they have to be those bits of knowledge because without those bits of knowledge your argument doesn't make sense and in those bits of knowledge you can be as precise and as specific as you want to be so for instance and this is a good test it's like the argumentative minimum test right like what are the number of axioms you need to believe in order for my argument to be operational and that's what you're doing here so let's just say that you're making an argument on um, let's take something like in, from financial economics. So let's just say that you're making an argument on how apps like Robinhood, which like, you know, lower barriers to, uh, to entry in the market for like uh, investors who don't have a lot of money, they cause equity bubbles, which leads to, uh, you know, a commodity crash down the line. Now, in order for you to make this argument, the judges need to know what the financial economic transmission mechanisms are, right? Why does increased speculation lead to increased hurting, lead to increase in the speculative value of like equity X, which leads to more hurting, which leads to the bubble expanding, which has problems because the equity might be invested in uh, different financial services, which might have knockoff impacts on more stable things like commodities in the form of houses or whatever it is. So, so in order for you to make the argument, they need to understand the economic science behind it. Why does impact X lead to impact Y? And so, so it's almost like making the arguments impact intuitive. You know, there's this joke about how sometimes in debates, like people would say something along the lines of, um, we killed someone and then someone died, right? Like, like in, in killing and physical harm and all of those things, impacts are actually very intuitive. It's very easy to be like, you know, this is impact X, this is impact Y. But in economic and IR motions, in order for you to get to the impact, you have to make sure that they understand what exactly happened here. So for instance, if you tell the average person, you know, uh, if the central bank prints more money, it causes inflation. It's not obvious why, like you need to explain why that's the case. So I think that's the threshold I would set, which is what the minimum number of facts that we definitely need to know in order for the argument to make sense. And then outside of that, it depends. I think the only other exception I would draw here is to say that um, examples can often be used or this sort of specialized knowledge can often help within closing teams. So for instance, in opening teams, there'll always be broad debates, especially in finance and IR motion. So in finance and IR motions, the opening teams are gonna come in and they're gonna say the typical things about, I don't know, democracy or financial stability and all of those things. In order for you to win at closing, you often need to have a specificity that the opening teams have not had. And that specificity is your virtue. So for instance, um, in a debate about, I don't know, the. Tigray Liberation Arm, the, the Tigray People's Liberation Front in uh, Ethiopia, or the Rakhine Salvation Army in like uh, in uh, Myanmar. Like, if you know specific things about these armies and dissident movements that other people don't, and they're just making the generic arguments about why like, you know protect the minorities and prevent U.S. intervention and all of those things, then you can come in and win the debate. And part of that is not just having a better argument. Part of that is also posturing to the judge that you know incredibly more about this uh, than uh, the opening teams do. So it's almost a credibility problem. So once you establish that level of credibility, it becomes much easier. Um, I hope that makes sense. Are there any other questions?
Okay. Uh, I will keep moving on then. Just check. I think the fourth thing I want to talk about is, okay, I've, I've most often taught this to Western teams. So this example is difficult, but like I can, I, I'm sure I can think of like a Islamic example, but like, um, you know, there's this idea of um, David versus Goliath, which comes from the Bible. And all it means is like, you know, David is like a, you know, human or, or Daud in this case, like is a, is a human being and then like fights against Goliath, which is like a massive thing. And then David sort of wins. And we sort of use this colloquially to mean like, you know, a contest between a big power and a small power, right? That's what you would call like a David versus Goliath thing. This is obvious. Um, I want to talk about how arguments should always be in search of David. Even when defending Goliath, this is really important. Um, how does that work? So, for instance, um, let's just say there is a debate about, like, you know, Microsoft or Amazon or some big company, right? There's something happening there, etc. And then you're making the argument that they should be regulated more slash broken up into smaller companies, like something is happening to them, which like, you know, is like more um, government intervention or something. So you are on this side and on this side, it's easy to make the arguments of, you know, um, these companies are exploitative to workers. Oh God, that was such horrible spelling exploitative to workers, they are exploitative to consumers. Let's take two. Oh, I'm very proud of myself. They are exploitative to consumers, etc. So then you win the debate. And then the, but the other side also has to have an argument, right? But the other side in this case is in a strange David versus Goliath contest because um, opposition seems to be in the awkward position of defending Goliath, which is Microsoft. And the thing is that like the global debating circuit is actually like shown that like, it's not just the global debating circuit, it's like most of us across the planet, but like debating circuit has a very strong, what's called in sociology underdog bias. Like we would much rather that like someone have make a hundred thousand pounds the first time, then make it the 20th time the same year sort of thing, right? Like, you know, if someone is significantly weaker than the other person, our intuition sort of like aligned towards that specific person. Um, now in that world, you are in the awkward position of defending Goliath, which is like Microsoft, even though this could debate could literally be about the Syrian government or like, you know, the big government versus the little guy, it could be lots of different debates, but there's often David versus Goliath sort of position set up. So you're here now, you're like, okay, what do I do? Because they keep saying Microsoft did bad things to workers and consumers. And we're like, you know, but don't hurt Microsoft. We sound like they're corporate lawyers. So how do we get out of it? And the way to get out of it is to search for David within Goliath. So what this would look like is you'd be like, wait, so, so you have to prove that Microsoft being regulated might lead to workers of the most vulnerable kind being hurt consumers of the poorest groups being marginalized and then you win the debate. So what you've done here is that instead of, and how do, how you do it would be like, you know, look, Microsoft isn't just Microsoft. So we're not defending Microsoft. What we are defending are some of the most vulnerable workers who work for Microsoft, namely workers like, you know, abroad workers on low wages. These are workers who would be the first to face the ax if Microsoft gets more regulation that they have to, have to put money into or if it's broken up or whatever it is, right? So 
these are people who are going to be the first ones to go from their jobs, not the richer people who are higher up in the company. So if you want to protect those vulnerable workers, you need to make sure that you don't regulate Microsoft. So what you've done there is that you're still defending Goliath, but you're doing this in the context of like, you know, pretending to like, or at least this valid argument on either side, but at least posturing by saying that you're actually looking out for David. And you will notice that this is a very common way to debate in our politics as well. So in politics, like no one will say, by the way, I hate the poor, right? Like, no, that's not a very common slogan. But even a right-wing government would say, um, you know, tax breaks for the rich are important because they open up the economy, hire more poor people, do more charity, etc. But if this right wing, economically right wing government had said taxes for the rich are important because they are my best friends, not a lot of people would vote for them, right? So we do this all the time. We often have uh, in politics people defending Goliath, but they're doing it in the context of defending David. Um, I mean, there's obvious examples in Pakistan as well. Can anyone think of an example in Pakistan where Goliath is often defended by, you know, thinking of David publicly? Anyone? Okay. Is everyone just that apprehensive about naming an example or do you want me to just uh, throw one out there? Okay, no, that's fine. Um, okay, what do you mean by that? Uh, okay, so we have two different examples. So, so let's take uh, uh, Ajwa. What do you mean by the PDM does that? No, no, you can also be audible, by the way. But if you're not comfortable being audible, you can say it on the chat. But feel free to be audible. Wait, can't uh, can't everyone speak? I thought the default was that anyone can be unmuted at any time. I didn't know that. Sorry, I, I've been expecting like um, audible interruptions throughout. Yeah, so I mean like uh, the alliance of PDM, uh, the way they try to uh, kind of like argue for their for their like very for their party to like come back into power even though it's full of like dynastic rich people who are going to keep on exploiting the poor is by saying is by like tapping into how like what they want is for like the poor uh, what they want is like for the poor to do better at extra so like they kind of use that same strategy yeah, we have no, that's true. In fact, I, I think that argument actually cuts across both ways. Before that, um, I just want to check, Tanya, if anyone wants to unmute themselves and speak, they're, they're allowed to do so, right? Like, they don't have to ask. Um, so they weren't allowed to do so, but I think we have like changed the settings now. Okay. They will be okay. able to unmute. Yeah, yeah, you okay. guys can unmute now. Okay, great. Um, but but anyway, so, so I, I think that PDM example sort of cuts across both ways because on the PDM end, it would be the argument of, uh, you know, uh, sort of like, you know, like, I know that corruption is endemic, but at the same time, like, this is a necessary component of policy making, all of that stuff, just one second Rehan. And then, but I think the argument is also made in the opposition camp to the PDM, where if the PDM, for instance, critiques like, uh, like a Goliath institution, like the army or something, then the anti-PDM camp would make a very oddly similar argument where they would be like, yes, but in reality, the reason that we need to protect the Goliath, in this case, the army, is to ensure stability for the masses, for the poor. So note that both of them are using the same David, but they're defending different Goliaths. It's, it's, it's actually very interesting and it's very pervasive across all of our politics. Um, Rehan, you had a question? I'm pretty sure you can be unmuted. Um, 
yeah uh, my question is that um if you're saying uh, if you're trying to defend the big countries who are invading the smaller countries then the opposition can say that the big countries are villains because uh, um one con one big country is not re can really attack but the other big country is trying to attack or like have some political leverage in order to show their power so these small countries are getting sucked up in their power vacuum or like their hunger for power so how do you defend from the gulf side no but but you argue that you're going in to protect the people of that country right like like never would even america make the argument of i mean with the exception of afghanistan which was absolutely nuts but like the never is the argument made that like you know we need to go into country x in order to protect ourselves like the argument that's consistently made in public discourse is we need to go into country x to protect the people of country x often against other people in country x for instance like a civil war in rwanda or by government x which would be the case in kosovo and uh, uh, libya and all those places so i i think that that clash sort of assumes the government argument being made badly but i think that government argument will be made the way we're talking about here right like goliath would defend its interests by simply saying we're going there exclusively to help the davids which are in this case the poor people of whichever country is being intervened in within that motion if that makes sense does that does that sort of answer your question yeah just a small extension um would you mind you go on go on go on um for example there is a faction in kashmir who does really wants kashmir to be independent they yeah. don't really want to go neither from to the pakistan side or neither to the indian side yeah. so what are the so what should i talk about these small countries who want to be liberated from or like doesn't really want any big countries but the big countries are literally wants to um devour it in the name of political safety or any kind of providing safety so what do you think about that what what do you mean like in what context like in as in like ethically and intellectually or do you mean like how, how would this come up in a debate um like um think of it as like um these countries do really want to be liberated but they are getting constantly uh, um dragged into these kind of political power vacuums yeah so how should you defend these countries or like how should you uh, the opposition to, should try to defend the small countries to antagonize the big countries so how when should these you... uh, smaller countries incentives are not really taken into consideration and we are always talking about the big countries i mean but that's like if you if you're saying this in the context of judges not realizing that smaller countries are important stakeholders then that's just a problem with bigoted uh, judging so so i i think then the problem occurs not at the level of you making the argument but at the level of who's listening to the argument so that's maybe like a cultural problem in the debating community i didn't recognize and perhaps you've pointed out but i think outside that it's actually very intuitive to make the the smaller country or smaller stakeholder argument because there you're not making the numbers argument right like smaller groups will are by definition smaller so you help less people by helping them but you make it in the context of duties right that a these big countries have done things to these small countries which means that they owe a moral obligation to fix those problems now b these people have suffered a lot more again the underdog bias than uh, people in these big countries have so we should care about them more so there's a lot of ways in which you can make this argument which doesn't have anything to do with the size of the country does that make sense yeah that does really make sense and it answers the question perfectly thank you okay no no problem um any other questions before we move on now that people um, yeah go on go on i'm going kind of to the extreme right wing um route and this might just sound horrible then, but that's um, right wing but go on uh, yeah so in the pandemic uh companies are downsizing uh their uh, they're downsizing their employees and that's something that is inevitable for the company survival yeah now okay yeah that directly supports the capitalist at you know the basics of his level yeah. but if we try to prove that this is important for two reasons that the products of the company is producing and selling out to the market it needs to retain the same price value so yeah. it does not put an added pressure to the consumer who already has less earning than before yeah and secondly the competitive market needs to exist so does this validate then does this validate what exactly 
uh, does this validate the debate not being um, just horrible stakeholder analysis? Um, I don't know about that. I, I, I think, I think, I think the anal if you mean ethically, probably yes, but I think in a purely argumentative sense, no, because I, I think it's a valid argument to make, like empirically at least. I'm sort of like normatively agnostic as to whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, because you know it's like the lockdown argument, like uh, especially where I'm I'm in in London right now. Like, uh, should we lift the lockdown or not? There is a very real argument for the deaths caused by the lockdown versus the deaths caused by it not having a lockdown. Now you can land on one side of the trade-off and say, fair enough, we need to care about the epidemiology or the epidemiology is necessary to care about before we care about the economy. But I think in all of these cases, there is analysis there. And I agree, it's not great to listen to. It's ethically also not the best, but but I would I would consider it to be valid analysis. Maybe I'm more charitable <laughs> as a debater than, than like some other people are, but like I I, I think that's uh, that's that's valid analysis in my opinion. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, are there any other questions before we move on? I have one question, but it might be like. Uh... It, it's about the example for related to that. So yeah. the thing is like, um, yeah, <laughs> there are some uh, like motions or areas that we don't know specific knowledge about and all you yes. know are vague things, right? Yes. So like, what do you do in those kind of situations because then you are at a particular like disadvantage. So how do you make your vague ana analysis like, like sound not bad? Okay, so let's just say the debate is about like, you know, let's take the worst example. This is about a random country, which is random to you, but not to like every everyone else. And it's like, it would be racist to think that like, you don't know anything about this country. And now you're debating about this country and you somehow need to make arguments about this country. Um, I think there's a couple of things that you can do there. So one is, and I've obviously like talked about this before, is do you know things about not one specific country next to them, but hopefully general trends, but, or even one specific country next to them, worst case, which might display a trend. So for instance, if Pakistan, and this is a hypothetical, if Pakistan has extremely high infant mortality, it would be really surprising if Afghanistan has extremely low infant mortality, knowing nothing about the two of them. If um, Sudan has extremely low literacy, it would be very surprising if neighboring Congo has extremely high literacy. It's because most things tend to geographically correlate. And the reasoning for that is because the environmental factors are more or less the same, even though you have like, you know, borders drawn up and different governments and whatnot. So often they'll be more or less the same, though not equal. You can think of some examples which are not true. So for instance, you know, the US and, the, and Canada are pretty similar, but the US and Mexico aren't, right? So there's some exceptions generally, but like 99% like of the time you can look at things around that specific thing and then sort of extrapolate information from that and be like, okay, if this was happening in country X, more or less must be happening in country Y. So you can start talking about that. But the second way in which I will answer your question is actually the next thing I wanted to cover so we can get to that now, or if there, does this also for now partly answer your question? And then you can also tell me, like jump in and say like, if it doesn't answer it later, is that fine? Yep, yep. Okay, great. Um, in fact, let's, let's just do this here. So actors versus actions. So in debates, you can run into some problems, such as the one that Ajwa pointed out, which can be a problem of knowledge. You simply don't know enough about something to make it uh, a defensible argument. You can also run into a problem of ethics, where you simply are defending someone that you would rather not defend. You also just run into a problem of reasoning more generally, which is like, you know, you can't think of good reasons to defend this person irrespective of what you think about them and how much you know about them. In this case, it is crucial that you move away from making arguments about the actor 
to making arguments about the action. And this is how I've seen like a lot of clever debaters win very, win very, very tough rooms pretty easily. So think about it this way. Let's say the motion is this house believes that um, this was actually the Oxford semi-final, I think this year. It was, it was really stupid. It was something like this house believes that the this house as okay no let's not do that it's so complicated that won't make sense let's just do a simple motion this house believes that um the rakhine salvation army should be sanctioned by the west for its illegal military actions or this house believes that, like, I'm going to keep it even more simple. Uh, this house believes that the new, uh, the new military government in Myanmar, okay, this is really easy, should be sanctioned by the West for its recent coup. This is the motion. And in this motion, you might not even know that a coup has occurred. Well, a coup occurred in Myanmar, but and you're like, okay, the coup occurred. Don't really know much about that. So a bit taken uh, uh, off guard by that. But then also you're like, but who is the new military government? Also don't know who that is. Why is the West sanctioning them? Sort of no, maybe because like, you know, something happened about the Rohingya in Myanmar, but that's about as much as I know. And then what you do there is that you just completely ignore the terms of the debate, which is, the new military government in Myanmar should be sanctioned by the West for its recent coup. I would just be like, this is a topic about actor X being sanctioned by actor Y. This is the first way I would read it. And then what I would do is give lots of reasons sanctions work and lots of reasons they don't, depending on which, which side you're on. Another way to look at this motion is military government in developing world is sanctioned by West. And now you're like, okay, lots of reasons that helps. Like, you know, it brings them to the negotiating table. It makes them more likely to listen to Western demands. And like, you know, also like lots of reasons that it doesn't. So, you know, the, that uh, they double down. Now they have a strongman complex. They need to show that they respond to the West. They can't act weak in front of the West. So these set of reasons you came up with about the action that is being taken, which is in this case sanctions, without knowing anything at all about the new military junta, about Myanmar per se, about the West, about the recent coup, because you're focusing on the sanction. And if you can focus on the sanction part, chances are that you can probably win the debate. And you can do this in lots of places. Like if the, if a topic comes up about how should should this like you know niche um, activism movement use rioting or violence as a tactic, instead of focusing on what the movement is and panicking, just be like, you know, ten reasons for why violence works, or like ten reasons for why violence doesn't work, depending on which side of the debate you're on. So you can often make the argument in the context of the action as opposed to the actor. And this also happens to answer, I think, Ajwa's question insofar as it shows that um, you can sidestep the entire problem by focusing on the basically the verb in the motion. Um, does that make sense? Ajwa, did you have any further comments there? No, I got uh, it. Can I ask a follow-up question to that? Uh, yeah, I just want to, before you do that, no, I just want to check if uh, uh, Ajwa was cleared up there. Was that fine? Yes, yes. Sir. Okay, great. Noor, go ahead. Right. So uh, the, the kind of spec knowledge that you told about, or let's say about the action should be focused when you don't know much about the actor. So it's context specific. So even though telling how war is bad, you can, like, there was a recent motion uh, about Japan, if I'm not wrong, at Yale which yes, actually nice, required familiar. specific knowledge about the context of the area. So even at openings, you could not go far without telling how war is bad and how defense or offense actually works. 
but you actually acquired quite specific knowledge for that to go deep, which is why people with less knowledge of that couldn't. Like what should, what is a better thing to do in that context to strategize and how to pick up a context or make it relevant within like a specific little amount of time? Um, okay. so. So one, uh, I'll just make this clear for everyone else listening. So there was a motion about how, the, so the Japanese government currently has constitutional provisions for only having what's called a self-defense force, which means this is constitutionally a force which can only attack in defense against aggression. But uh, there was a motion about whether Japan should sort of scrap that and have like a military force which can intervene other places as well. And obviously the question is, how do you do the thing I just said, but not in opening? I think actually because the opening gets lost in the details, like I've often noticed there'll be a debate about the IMF and like some random African or Latin American or Asian country. And they would just like spend so much time showing the context of that country, the context of the IMF. And then like someone would come in in closing and be like seven reasons the IMF is bad and then take a first in the debate and walk away. So one, I would say I, I push back against this idea that like, you know, in debates like these, everyone takes the obvious stuff in opening. I think especially with debaters, there's a tendency to flex their, you know, information as much as possible. Like, you know, I read The Economist, so I know what you're talking about. So I'm just going to spend the next four minutes like citing from the article or whatever. So I do think that often happens. So closing often has a lot of space to just make generic arguments about, you know, Japan will be bad at having a force like this. People in Japan might be sad at them having a force like this. China might be angry at them having a force like this. And the reasons, many reasons why that's bad. America might be sad that they do something like this. So, so again, I think you will still have lots of intuitive argumentation left still. But however, assuming that's not true, um, let's say that they've taken those things. How do you reframe the debate? I think that's a general question about extensions. And if I'm not wrong, uh, my friend Taha is giving an entire session on extensions if I'm not wrong. But um, the short answer here would be that um, you either fill the analytical gaps, which is to say they made the argument but they made it poorly. So you figure that out. Um, or you use the strategy that I actually discussed with Taha a few months ago. So I hope it comes up in this discussion which is known as the wash way new metric strategy. So whenever you're speaking in extension, so this is a digression, but I think like it's an important thing for you guys to know anyway, you generally should focus on these three things. Wash means to make the analysis of opening irrelevant. Um, way means to have better analysis on same point as opening. And then new metric means is to have different analysis arguments from opening. If you can do all three in extension, you will never lose a debate. So I'll, I'll give you a very simple, quick example here. So, so, so Rakib, so Rakib just asked me a message about like, you know, don't you think Japan must have an army or force to get rid of the American resistance assistance regarding the defense of the, what are variously known as the uh, South China Sea islands, like, you know, the Senkaku or Diyu islands. And I, I think yes, but I, I, I wasn't being prescriptive here. So the idea wasn't that I was endorsing that Japan can't do this. It was more that, uh, uh, that was in the context of the debate. However, if you message me on Facebook or something, I'm very happy to have like a uh, more extensive discussion on, you know, like East Asian politics because I find that really interesting. Uh, but yeah, so how would you do this? So let's just say that there's this very simple motion, which is like, you know, um, this came up like before Euros, like, you know, um, you are a young, talented, professional, in the Balkans, which is like, you know, um, Europe, but not really Europe would be the joke from my friends in the Balkans, but I basically mean places like um, Serbia, et cetera here. Um, and then the motion was, this house would travel to live and work in the EU. Sure, fair enough. So opening does all of the obvious stuff. OG will do all the obvious stuff about, you know, how you know, good for you because EU 
much bigger, um, more market, more jobs, better jobs, better standard of living, all of that stuff. Oh, came in and then said like, you know, bad for you because uh, lots of racism against you, um, uh, much more, much bigger problems with um, competing against more skilled people um, will generally face discrimination. This is all stuff that came up in OO. So we were CEO. And what we did was we were like, we have to weigh, we have to wash, we have to have a new metric. So how did we uh, weigh? So first we went towards OO and we said that OO's, so we said OO's claims are about how this is economically bad for you. And then we gave like three better reasons. So one was just like, you know, purchasing power parity, like, you know, a Serbian currency denomination counts for much less in Europe. Um, the second would just be um, different educational standards. So even if you're an extremely talented student in Serbia, just like you are often in Pakistan, because of global problems with recognizing educational qualifications, your qualifications just don't count the same in many places abroad, such as the EU. And then there was something about how you're competing against like, you know, global pool as opposed to local pool because you know in europe you're competing against like indian doctors and nigerian engineers like you're not just competing against uh, uh people within your own community so this is how we sort of weighed and got our way out of like proving oo's own claim better than they did but then we weren't done right because we want to win on every metric so then the second would be to wash and the wash is to make analysis of both openings irrelevant so we said both openings had long-term analysis about living here versus not living here. And we said that is irrelevant because Serbia is about to join the EU in five years, which would mean that living in Serbia would be same as living in the EU. So in that case, this debate doesn't make sense. So, so then we were like, the, the only arguments that exist in this debate are necessarily short-term arguments, which is what we did with the new metric thing. So we were just like, our new metric is the psychological trauma of being dependent on immigration status. And then we talked about lots of things, how once you move into this area, you consistently have to keep the same bad job in order to not lose your immigration status. You could literally be kicked out legally for any reason if the country wants you to. Whenever you move into a new neighborhood, it's all about getting the documentation signed. You're so constrained in so many parts of your life, which, is which, which relationships you should start, which relationships you, you should keep, because you never know when you will be asked to leave the EU. So there's lots of psychological trauma, which comes from being an immigrant within the region. So we just use that as our new metric. And that's how we attempted to win by A, weighing their reasons against our reasons for the same claims, B, washing their arguments, and then C, drawing up a new metric. So this was a very long answer to that question. But I think like the answer is that like everyone should generally know this. So this is a very useful tactic in coming up with analysis when you otherwise don't have any. No, does this make sense? Yep, it does now. Thank you. Okay, great. Are there any other questions? And can also like someone discipline me for time? Like what? how, how, how long do we want this to be? Um, as long as you want. Uh, there's a uh, question in the comment by the uh, chat box, by the way. <clears throat> okay. Um, let me try to open it. I don't know how I would do that. There we go. Okay, sorry. That's Aditi's question. And the question is, what you said about lack of knowledge definitely makes sense in terms of IR. But how do you do that for econ motions specific to countries? Um, Aditi, do you want to make yourself audible and then like throw out a specific motion? Maybe we can very quickly look at that. If Aditi is still here. She might have just given up considering I spent like yeah. 10 minutes in the last question. Okay, there we go. Go no, on. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, so I don't have a motion in mind, but like uh, when you're debating in India, so you have like very specific 
uh, Indian economic, like related to those motions, which we probably don't know about. Or even in global terms also, there yeah. are these economic motions where, which are very specific in terms of the economies of specific countries. Yeah. So like, how do you then go about debating? So, okay, but can you, can you, can you give me an example of not emotion, but like what you're talking about, because I'm still uh, unclear on what you're getting at here. Uh, okay. Like any example. So, uh, it, okay, so if, if it's about a banking system or say, uh, it, like you were talking about bailouts also, yeah. right? And I just don't have any clue about how all of this works at all. And like, I, I might have a very vague idea, but yeah. not like you know, if I could make a very strong reasoning or analysis. So uh, like in Aya, you said that, you know, you can go about talking about countries which are very closer or like in terms of like generalized, in generalized terms, but yeah. then economic, it becomes difficult uh, doing that in economic yeah. motions, right? And that's specifically because the action that you would be analyzing, the transmission mechanism, you just don't have enough knowledge about how that works. Is that the case? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So for instance, like if the motion is like, you know, uh, this was an actual again motion at Oxford, which was horrible, but something like uh, this house would not buy bonds from the Venezuelan government. Now you're stuck in a bit of a bind here because A, you have to know what's happening in Venezuela. So that's the first bit. But then the second bit is what are bonds? Why does buying bonds matter? And how does not buying bonds lead to outcomes? So, so that's like a classic example of the sort of motion you're probably talking about, right? I think there, what we try to do at least was then just make it much more about the country as opposed to the action. So you can sort of flip the analysis, right? So it'll be all of the stuff will then be about, um, you know, Venezuela doing better or doing worse or characterization analysis basically and waiting for the other team to say something uh, unless you're OG as opposed to um, specifically looking at the action. Now, you might say, what if I don't know either? And I, and I, you know what, like, I think there's a implicit search for an answer there. And I think I'm gonna be a good person here and say that the answer is that you have lost the debate probably because that's just a bad motion setting or that's like setting inaccessible motions. Or you know what, maybe it's your fault or my fault for not reading up enough about that part of the world or not reading up enough about, um, you know, uh, specific financial mechanism. So yeah, I, I think implicit in your question is, uh, what if I know nothing, I need to win. And I think the answer is you probably lost because you lost like two weeks ago when you didn't read up about it. So I, 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 don't, I don't think I have a very satisfying answer here, but I hope that helps somewhat. Yeah, it definitely makes sense. Okay, okay. That, that's all I can hope for from that answer. Um, great. One new message. Oh, wow, that's a long one. Okay. Okay, uh, Bob, can you send this to everyone so that everyone can see this? Because then I have to read out the whole question and this is lengthy. So... But isn't okay. So how do you deal with factual claims that you know are clearly wrong, but isn't intuitive to the average reasonable judge? And B is fundamental to their case. Yeah, no, I, I remember this. Like, you know, Ethiopia having a coastline means Saudi Arabia wants to be friends with them. Ethiopia doesn't have a coastline. Eritrea has a coastline, which is next to Ethiopia. So that that is pretty close. No, that's fair. Um, I don't think the, there's an answer there because again, um, it's a flaw in the activity, right? So let's just say that you're a debater from Pakistan and you're in, in like a room with three British teams being judged by a British judge. Now, hopefully when you say something about Pakistan, they believe it, but at the same time, it, they might not believe it because everyone else has a very similar knowledge or it can't even be about Pakistan, it could be about something else. Um, and I think the answer there is just like, you know, I don't know. The answer probably is people will keep doing that and we need to hold people to account and debating is a good faith activity. Like I've seen people like lie a lot to win finals and you can't do anything about that. And again, all you can do is to keep reading and hope that the average reasonable judge or average reasonable voter or whatever it is becomes much more likely to know these things. So that's part of the culture of the debating community that we want to change to make it more global. But two, to make sure that like cases aren't won uh, on the context of singular facts, right? Like, like if they literally won the entire debate on the premise of Ethiopia having a coastline, then that was either a bad debate or a bad judge, 
right? Because I can still think of several reasons for why, despite the coastline, like there are many reasons why Saudi Arabia wouldn't want to be friends with them. Does that make sense? So like, I, I think it sort of goes both ways. Um, finally, this the question by Nadim, which is, if I add more um, emotional stuff or rhetoric, um, does that work as a new analysis compared to the opening half? Um, I think it depends on what, what you call it, right? Because like, I, would, I wouldn't call it emotional stuff or rhetoric. I would call it like a, like a principal analysis, for instance, would definitely count as legitimate closing material. So for instance, if you have a motion about like, you know, this house believes that the military government in Myanmar should be sanctioned by the West for its recent coup. Um, and then you are CO and you're saying it shouldn't be. In CO, if you didn't like a principally pure argument about how the violation of Myanmar's sovereignty is the most important thing in this debate, it's not a great argument, but it's an argument that is legitimate and you can maybe even win the debate on it. So, so you can make principal arguments which aren't hung on outcomes, but I don't think that it necessarily needs to be like just pure rhetoric because then that's actually very hard to prove. I say this as like having jokes in like 80% of my speeches. So it, it works sometimes, but I would, I would heavily suggest against it. Um, any other questions? Yeah, I have, I have a question. question. Um, how about Tanya first and Rehan? Go ahead, Tanya. Okay, no worries. Tanya can go first. Um, yeah, so like uh, usually I've heard like judges talking about how like maybe that one particular argument was actually good, but it, like yeah. it wasn't maybe impacted enough. So like even if you are doing the impacting, how how do you know that like this impact of an argument is like plausible enough to complete that particular that that one argument and like you know that like this argument is complete and like you can actually win on this argument. And you don't exactly have to do like more weighing or more impacting of this argument now. Okay, and do you have an do you have an example there from a debate that this has happened to you in? Uh, okay, so like uh, one could be regarding there was uh, probably one regarding uh, maybe because you were in the motion setting committee, so you would probably know that motion as well. Uh, Black genders. Uh, so uh, it was about uh, I think uh, West actually putting the sanctions on who um, are Chinese tech and the Chinese goods and services, etc. Like something somewhat related. Uh, so uh, probably like maybe us talking about like as opposition talking about why uh, like doing that to China is like actually a bad option because China can actually retaliate as well and because China won't exactly um, have that kind of opposition anymore because you're putting sanctions so China can literally go on exploiting the countries mm -hmm. that like third world countries that they were talking about and like won't even have any opposition in that case so like like things like that like talking about uh, like uh, different uh, reasons why China wouldn't exactly be held accountable or why China wouldn't exactly uh, uh, do the things probably you want them to do, like uh, things like that, maybe. So, like how? Okay, do you, like, and then the judges oh, felt that it was insufficient the impacting. So maybe like oh, so like the idea about accountability is like uh, uh, like according to them was like a good enough argument, but uh, maybe like there could have been more weighing or impacting into it. So like how do you make sure that the impacting is like good enough or like rounded enough for you for th that argument to like win you that debate? Okay, okay, that's fair. Um, I think that impacting becomes intuitive when it's now down to, it's sort of like, a, do you know what, what like, a, like you, have you guys like grown up and done, like obviously you have, I really hope so because I was really bad at this, like a least common multiple and highest common factor, that sort of thing. And then do you remember this? Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. Okay, great. So, 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 so you know how eventually you get down to like something like, um, wait, Yes, they, yes they, that's right, I mean, uh, LCM. So like you get down to like some combination of like multi, like prime numbers, like, you know, two into four isn't a prime number, three into three or whatever, right? So you get to this sort of space where you started by some, with some weird number. So I think that's how I think of impacting at least psychologically, which is that um, the impacting has to come down to that level of simplicity for it to be intuitive, for instance. More people hurt um, or more people benefit. Like it needs to be that clear. Um, but in this case, the argument you were making, powerful country becomes more powerful, which creates inequality. But this would also sort of also default to more people hurt or more people um, benefited. Um, 
also like more inequality generally is a pretty good one that you can come down on um hurting the most vulnerable is another one violating duties is another one um is there any other ones um this is this is this is more or less it but this is what this is what i do like i'm just like can you keep going through the impacts of an argument until you get to a point where you can literally say and because of this this will end up hurting more workers hurting more consumers because of this there's more inequities within the global political system because of this you're hurting the most vulnerable workers or consumers because of this you're violating duties that we have to other countries or whatever so if you can sort of do this thing with like with the prime numbers and everything and then you can come down to here then you've basically made your impacting into it that is how i think about it does that does that answer your question yeah it does okay okay i'm glad i took a very weird way to get there but we got in the end um rehan what is your question yeah my question is a bit like throwing an odd ball to the turf so no, my no. question is regarding the sports kind of motion you suppose you're in a room full of sport sports nerd and you don't you are not sports nerds the motion... by the way is a contradiction in terms but go on uh, yeah okay so you're i'm yeah. in a room with sports nerds what happens okay so so this uh, so the motion is like michael jordan is overrated michael jordan is a basketball player but you don't really watch basketball but all the three teams have a lot of knowledge about basketball team basketball yeah. so how do you make you not make yourself a laughing stock into the room even though you have lost all the lost the debate from the get go but you haven't lost the debate from the get go because you don't need to know about basketball to win that's what i'm trying to say um if we had a motion about nfl draft picks at um, was it you was it docs page i can't remember but like there was a motion about like you know should the nfl have draft picks about like something to do with hiring managers or i can't i can't even remember we knew nothing about this um uh, i think it was called the rooney rule if i'm not wrong but there was there was there was something about this and we basically knew nothing about this motion and then we just won because we just thought it had to do with politics and society because i think a general i know you used the sports example as a demonstration of your general point but specifically with regards to sports um no sports motions are about sports is a very good rule to follow because they are never like it's never about like you know with what, what what does this mean ronaldo is offside or like you know um those sort of things like most motions are about society about inequality about imp, about uh, ec economic impacts political impacts all of those things so that's the first thing i would say um and then the second thing i would say is i think you can win dependent on how much they get lost in the technicality of things because i think often what happens is um you can go in and then someone knows everything about basketball so they'll spend the next 15 minutes talking about it as opposed to having argumentative analysis so i think it's almost liberating to not knowing anything about these things because then you can just walk away with simple argumentation as opposed to you know showing off that you read sports illustrated or whatever that hopefully answers your question a little bit is that yeah that answer of question my question i asked it because uh, a few months ago i did a new zealand comp and there was a motion regarding a rugby so as i was in closing and they were like saying spouting all kinds of technical terms and it was like confused unga banga in my mind so yeah. uh, that's the reason why i asked like saying no, that you have lost that's the reason why i said that okay no no, no very fair very fair i i think i've noticed a general trend in the questioning here as well I think sometimes the problem is not with what you're saying but with like you know like I don't want to be on those people and be like beta aapka masla nahi unka masla but like it is true like like on some level this is just a problem with bad judging or bad debating tactics or bad debating cultures or whatever it is so so don't don't like you know uh blame yourself too much here that's what I would say I'm also going to wrap up supposed to wrap up in about 10 to 15 minutes so although I have a bit more stuff I wouldn't mind covering I would also be very happy for me to take questions like these because there are like a bunch of people on the call so taking more questions would also be very was something I'm very happy to do instead of diving into something new Okay so Sutani so I suggest that I cover more um i was just checking if the people agree with her but the people seem to be early silent so i will stick with 
Um, okay, there we go. We got one. Um, so Ayana asked, I've heard a ton of good judges say I've lost to my opening because I haven't weighed enough. So the way I whip is this, this whip this is to say opening has these holes that my members fill them, but that doesn't seem to be working. Oh, but that's because that's one sort of weighing, right? So um, wait, there's another question. Oh, brilliant. Oh, yes, please cover more. Okay, I feel like Tanya messaged whoever sunrise and be like, also, also say this, but fair enough. Um, and, and Manal, you probably have a WhatsApp chat going, guys. But um, let me quickly answer Ayana's question and then we can um, uh, move on from that. So the question is pretty simple. Um, hmm. So I, okay, so I think weighing can be of several kinds. I actually had like a the lecture of like six different kinds of weighing, but like, like very quickly, weighing can be of several kinds. So, so one is probability weighing which is both teams reach for outcome X, but you prove outcome X better. The problem with this sort of weighing, which is what you're doing, or the limitation of it, it's not necessarily bad, is that you're still proving outcome X. So it's not always clear that you've won. And it's always subjective as to which team has better proved the probability of an argument. Another one is impact weighing, right? So this would be more like a, both uh, diff teams, both teams reach for different outcomes, and both teams attempt to prove that impact that their chosen outcome is more important. And this will usually be in the context of the things we just said, more people hurt, more people benefited a numbers game, uh, and ontological arguments like inequality, um, hurting the most vulnerable, violating duty. So according to that metric, who's winning? And yeah, no, so, so, so let's stick with these two for now. So, so I think if you do more impact wing, Ayana, instead of just probability wing, it becomes easier to win the debate because I do think that uh, probability wing can be hard to adjudicate well because if they give three reasons for why outcome X is true and you give four reasons, did you really win it past them? They, I think there's also this general bias on the circuit that like, you know, analytical extensions aren't amazing. So I would I would usually try to reach for impact weighing also, not just probability weighing. Does that sort of answer your question? I truly hope so. Okay, great, amazing. Um, let's cover a little bit more because we have like, let's, let's cap ourselves at uh, in like 10, 15 minutes. Okay, let's do a little bit more. Um, okay, great. Um, so another thing I want to talk about in terms of advanced argumentation is difference between different, okay, no, that's a redundant sentence, different moral duties. Okay, I'm going to try to speed through this. This will be difficult, but I think we can make it. So first thing, we have rights. Yes, hopefully, obviously. And rights are only operational insofar as they impose obligations on others. So this is, this is a very important idea to understand, which is, um, okay, so the first thing I want to caveat here is please don't make analysis about how there used to be pre-nation societies and then they did not have rights. And then we started having rights when nations came into existence. And then since then we've had rights because we have states. Like, I don't know where, what the gen genesis of this analysis is in, is, is in the local circuit, but I've seen it so many times. I would heavily insist against um, using that analysis. If you want the reasoning for why, I'm happy to give it later, but like, that's just a caveat I want to make here before we dive into this discussion. Um, okay, so rights are only operational so far as they impose obligations on others. So for instance, my right to life only makes sense in the context of everyone else around me not now having an obligation on them themselves not to kill me. So this is important. Rights imply 
obligations. This is the first step is important to understand. So which is, this is why when you make an argument about like, you know, this violates my right to association or my right to freedom of uh, liberty or like my right to freedom of speech or the reason it sounds so weak is because you guys uh, sometimes maybe don't make it in the context of obligations, which makes it a lot more principally powerful because then it's not necessarily about your right being violated so much as other people violating the obligation that was placed on them, right? So, so I think the obligation analytical step is very important very important in terms of making a principled argument more weighty. That's the first step. The second step here is um, states also have obligations. Now, the first part of this is that um, this, this is the thing that you will definitely know, which is that you can have two sorts of rights. Or liberties. This is the part you will definitely know, which is like sort of negative liberties, which are freedoms from, so like, you know, freedom from intervention, freedom from violence, those sort of things. And then you will have what are called positive liberties, which are freedoms to, so, you know, freedom to participate in the political process, freedom to uh, voice your concerns and have freedom of speech and all those things. So you have two sorts of liberties. So in terms of freedoms from, the reason that states also have obligations is in this context. Um, states must protect your rights, but in doing so, they necessarily have to impose obligations on others. So let me try to make sense of this for you. So let's just say that Pakistan signs the Convention Against Torture, you know, the CAT, just sign. This is just a convention which says like, you know, torture is illegal and bad. Now the state is in a legally binding position to not torture its citizens. However, along with the state's obligation to not torture you, it has to similarly apply an obligation on others not to torture you because the state is the arbiter is the only arbiter of obligations. So let me explain what this legal legalese means. This is really important because this is how you make the argument from state responsibility, which I think is again, not, it's it's made in a sort of like flaky rhetorical sort of way, but it's never made seriously as an argument. So, so the way that you make it seriously as an argument is that you say, look, the states has certain duties towards you. This is something that people will universally agree. Like for instance, the state, does not have the right to kill you. The state does not have the right to torture you. However, considering that the state is the only agency in the country, which can also impose obligations on others, part of its duty to not torture you must surely include ensuring that others don't torture you because the state is the only actor which can do so. So what would be, what, what happens then basically is that alongside the state's duty to not torture you, it has to apply an obligation not to torture you to guarantee your right to be free of torture. Because remember that the state's obligation to not torture you comes from the initial premise that you have a right to be free from the fear of violence. And if the state the agency which can protect that right and has to do so both in the obvious sense of not torturing you, but also in the more substantial sense of creating an environment where they won't torture you. This is precisely why even if you have governments which are more or less well-intentioned, but they're completely inept and incompetent in terms of ensuring outcomes for their people, the international community has to step in and intervene because the state has violated its minimal obligations to citizens, even if it's not explicitly hurting them, it, the, the violation of its duties is so deep that it's basically hurting them. Do you have any questions about how 
uh, individual rights or state responsibility arguments for it before I quickly make a final point. Okay, great. Um, the second thing I want to talk about quickly here is about duties and in, in sort of two ways. So the first thing is, and I, you might have seen me use this a lot if you have ever seen me, which is certainty versus uncertainty. So using this argument well is really important. So one second, what does the chat say? Uh, okay, Sana, how about you make yourself audible and like explain what you mean there? Unless you can't, which is fine. Like you can just like type out the whole question on the chat. Is that, okay, I'll just wait for you to do that. Meanwhile, I'll just keep typing. Okay, so certainty versus uncertainty. So this argument is often made in the context of when it is obviously bad that doing nothing, it, it, it is obviously, it is obvious that doing nothing is bad, but it is unclear as to how bad it is to do something. This is, by the way, an intuitive argument for status quo reform. Like this is one of the most classic philosophical arguments used for reforming whichever world you live in right now. So the, and, and this is like, I've used this argument so many times. So for instance, if like, if there's a debate about the US intervening in some country, one side would be like, you know, the US can't go in because the US might make things worse, might more people might die. What if other powers get involved, all of those things. And the line that you take there is you say, yes, those things are possible. I am going to give you reasons for why they're unlikely, but nonetheless, they're possible. But if the US does nothing, it is definitely sure that people keep dying. So I we would rather pick the option where you're doing something where the harms are unclear to doing nothing where the harms will continue to occur and are absolutely clear. So using the certainty versus uncertainty modeling of framing moral responsibilities is really important because it just gives you an intuitive advantage whenever you're reforming status quo in any way, whether that's like a local policy or intervening in another country. So that's an important thing to remember. Um, Sana, were you gonna come back in on your question? I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll wait in any case. Um, the second thing then that you should think about is passive versus active duties. So the way this works is sort of the flip of what we were talking about with certainty versus uncertainty. So for instance, you can say that um, all active duties are in fact passive duties in order to win the debate. Or you can do the flip, which is that all passive duties are in fact active duties. Again, depending on which side of the debate you're on. So what does this mean? Um, think about it this way. Let's just say that there's a motion which is something along the lines of, um, you know, the US should, you know, intervene or in some country or like, let's take something simpler. So let's just say that the US has to pay uh, reparations to, you know, uh, black community because of the history of slavery and everything. So let's just say that's the topic. And the reason that the US has to do so is because the US has an active responsibility towards what happened in the case of slavery. Now, the, there's, there's a couple of problems which happened there. So you can argue it from, cul from culpability or you can argue it from beneficence. Oh, I actually spelled that right. No, I didn't. Ah. But so, so what does this mean? So if you say that the US has an active responsibility to what happened um, in terms of slavery, people will be like, yeah, but like, you know, the US government was different then. And like much more importantly, like, you know, not all white people were responsible for this. So why aren't white people getting reparations? All of those things come up. 
So this is why culpability is a much higher bar to meet. Usually, the lower bar to meet is beneficence, which is to say, um, it's not that all of you were actively responsible, but it's more that all of you were complicit because all of you benefited from it and did nothing about it. So that's why you're responsible. So for instance, you don't have to be someone who's, uh, you know, cracking the whip on a plantation in the South in order to qualify someone who should be uh, who should have money taken away from them for reparations. You can also be a neighboring farmer who has no slaves on the plantation, but whose economy thrives on their being slaves in the economy more generally and does nothing about slavery. So you can be like millions of people like that. Note that this argument also makes sense in the context of sexism and racism, where you know a lot of people would come up to you and be like, you know, um, I, I get that, like, you know hashtag all men, but really hashtag all men, because like, you know, I haven't done this or whatever it is. So, so, and then like, you know, so I'm not responsible for this or whatever. And then in addition to you arguing that like, you know, you can argue it from culpability, which is the no, you are responsible. A much lower conversation bar, they would just be like, yes, but the reason that we're talking to you as well is because you benefited from the system where many people were responsible. So you're still complicit. So, so I think this, this, this is like passive benefit versus active benefit. So keeping that in mind is really important in terms of establishing the sort of argumentative bar you need to win the debate. Otherwise, it becomes a bit harder to win these sort of debates. There's like other distinctions here as well that I would want to make, but I'm also very happy to come back at some point and then give another lecture. But having said that, are there any parting questions? I have a couple of questions, if you don't mind. How about you pick your favorite one? Go ahead. Um, the first one is regarding like the rights and the second one is like the EPL bias judges. So which one do you really want to answer? Like, okay, quick, quick, okay, quickly cycle through them. Let's see what happens. Um, my question regarding rights, like uh, regarding rights, so a criminal has been verdict uh, like proven guilty to uh, yeah. like uh, strongly so with yeah. uh, like empirical evidence but what about his rights when he's in jail for example there uh, there was an example regarding a scandinavian cell a scandinavian country where a rapist was given extra facility and he demanded that he should have get some kind of extra facility into yeah. his cell so how should you like why should you preserve his rights when he's a criminal in the first place because he has done something really vicious to not and have what about the those yeah, rights. i get the question and what about the epl question and the second question is like, when you are in opening, you are clear, you are making some making the mechanization of your arguments, but then the closing comes and paraphrases your mechanism and claims it as their own, and the judge judge is a bias towards EPL uh, to that EPL team. So hmm. how do you mechanize uh, so well in the opening so that the judges will feel guilty to make some kind of EPL biases? Okay, how do you work hard enough so as to overcome systemic racism? I do not know the answer, but what I will say is that this is definitely a very serious problem. And the way that you deal with it again is like, you know, making sure that you don't blame yourself that much, making sure that if you do blame yourself, it's in a productive way, which is like, you know, if this is something that's happening, what I can do is work on myself and ensure I give the best speeches. And then also being open and frank with your debate fraternity being like, you know, uh, this person was like this and, and maybe we can go and talk to them in terms of their judging. But I think the final thing I'll say about that very quickly is really, really make sure that this conversation happens in a way that's a conversation starter and not a conversation stopper. Because I've seen that these conversations often escalate very quickly and then just like stop. So like, you know, um, if you go up to a judge and be like, wasn't this an EPL extension from the closing or whatever, um, that's such an incendiary charge that that would, that would just halt the conversation as opposed to continue it. So I think uh, having this conversation in a way that's, you know, uh, cognizant of you feeling misguided, 
but then also uh, we're feeling uh, misled, but then at the same time, also keeping an open mind, basically having lots of good faith in the conversation. It reminds me of like, uh, I was having dinner yesterday with a couple of friends and uh, one of them, uh, his, his, his boyfriend, they're getting married soon. And the, my, my third friend had lots of questions about how that works and everything. And he dealt with it really well. Like, like, like he knows that the questions are somewhat problematic in some way, because you know what, like gay people have the same edges that straight people do, I promise. But like, you know, he answered them with the, oh, that's a really good question. That's really interesting. this maybe you read about say that like when you deal with people like that like just have lots of good faith just assume until you're absolutely sure that this was a good faith problem and it can be dealt with in good faith um in terms of quickly your prisoner question i think the answer there is just very quickly we don't do it to protect the prisoner we do it to protect broader moral goals that we have as a society so for instance i don't want to live in a society where even the most like you know vile people who commit the most vile and inhuman acts have to suffer for the same reasons that I don't want a Taliban as society where if you like, you know, kill someone, they get to kill someone from your community. So I think we give that person rights and privileges and uh, education and rehabilitation, not because they did something like that, but despite them doing something like that and for broader goals that we have as sort of like a progressive society. Um, hope that answers both questions. Um, very quickly, how do you debate if you have limited uh, knowledge in regret motions where no specific action is happening. Shadib, I would definitely need more context to answer this one. Um, but um, for now I can say, um, so like let's just say the topic is this house regrets the Indian partition, but you have no idea what the Indian partition was about. I guess it's difficult there. I think if you're closing, you can still manage because like opening sort of sets up the terrain. This is about religious minority protection or this is about religious polarization. If those are the two different arguments on both sides. And then you just like sort of like give generic arguments about that. But if that doesn't happen and you're OG on a regrets motion, not knowing what you're regretting, then <laughs> I don't know, buddy. I think, I think, I think you've lost the debate. Like I, I'm being honest. Like I, I think any answer I come up with will be speculative. Like you, we just need to read up more or make sure that CA is at better motions. Um, Bob, very quickly, what are your favorite resources for matter loading principles? I have, if in, in complete honesty, never matter loaded anything. So I'm a very bad person to ask this. I generally enjoy reading a lot. So maybe that's where they come from. But um, I think like my, my debate partner Taha would be a good person to ask about this maybe. Uh, but if you have like questions about, for instance, like a specific uh, philosophy text that you're looking at or a specific ethical problem, feel free to message me on Facebook and I'll probably have a reading that I was reading or a book that I would be happy to recommend on that question. Um, Noor, are there any resources or sites you would recommend to keep up with practical or evaluative information that isn't mostly about US or China? Um, yes, so a bunch actually. So, so I think, hmm. So I think if you actually read um, the IMF, World Bank, um, UNHRC, UNHCR reports, like UNDP reports, um, Oxfam reports, um, like most international organizations and INGOs have really fantastic reports. Like, I just don't think people go through them. Like, I, I think it's a sort of like a straw man to say that they're always about the US or China. I think the headlines are, which is like New York Times and Bosch Po, but like, um, the, that 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 reports that soup and potato stuff the everyday stuff it's really fantastic so i would just literally go through international organizations ingos and then look up like extremely good analysis that they have on by the way the thing we were talking about trends and patterns what is digital access like across the world what are human rights records now as it stands what are democracy indicators from freedom house like i i, I think you can find lots of stuff that isn't about the us or china if you look in the think tank ingo um IO policy space. And then finally, read other newspapers which aren't American or British. So I would suggest reading the South China Morning Post. It's a very, very good newspaper. It is fairly international. I would also suggest reading um, Al Jazeera, which is not the best on Qatar because of where it's located, but it's at the same time uh, a fairly decent publication generally. Also try to read other newspapers which are uh, Western, but not British or American, right? So, so Le Monde from, from France is a fantastic one. 
uh, Deutsche Welle from Germany, Der Spiegel um, are really good newspaper options. So yeah, I think long story short, you can find them. Um, the Hindustan Times, you want to read what India is decent. India Today is fine. Um, so, so you can definitely find them. Like I would just expand the diversity of your news diet and then start reading more reports, which is boring, but like, you know, that's how you get there. Um, Debayan, I remember you were talking about 12 ways to rebut somewhere. Could you just mention the headings? I will have to explain this, Debayan. So uh, if you could message me on Facebook or something, I will, I will send these this to you and then we can discuss this. Then there's a random V from someone. And oh, they was ignored this, please. Never mind. And then Ayana says, are there any specific exercises, drills that you'd recommend for someone who were who was prepping for a major? Um okay, so again, I'm such a bad person to ask about this because I, I have like no 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 training discipline because like we just like you know just like chill outside and have a coffee and then maybe prep a motion and then speak a tournament. Like that's it. Like I, I, I think we're actually bad people to ask about this specific question about exercises or drills. Having said that, I did speak with someone who uh, last year who had a lot more discipline than I did. So um, I think I can tell you what her tactics were. So for instance, um, one is obviously watching debates and then the other is prepping motions. But then you can do this in between, which is helpful, which is that you can watch really good rounds and rooms and then speak as leader of opposition, or you can speak as deputy prime minister in that debate, assuming you were there. And I think that just like, that's really hard to do initially and it's sort of awkward, but like, if you can start assuming that you're in that room, like, you know, HWS top room or world's final or whatever it is, and you start speaking like that, I think that's a very good drill to have in terms of prepping for a major. Also finally, like digital uh, stuff, like, you know, because of COVID, everything's online now. So please always feel free when you're prepping for a major to reach out to circuits across the world. Everyone is really happy to do spars. So they'll just reach out to different teams for spars everywhere. I'm sure some of them would be happy to do a spar. So that would be another way to prep for a major in a way that was like impossible to do previously. So, so that's, that's really good. Um, Sana said, can you please write all those names? I will do that in a second. And then there's a question about if you have any official Facebook page or any other debate group, kindly inform. No, I don't. Um, and then Sana finally asks of reports, which you just talked about right now. Okay, no, I was just naming organizations left, right, and center, but like examples here would be Oxfam does great research on global inequality, um, a human rights watch, um, obviously works on human rights, but in a progressive space. So for instance, like unlike many traditional human rights organizations, they would be very happy to focus on things like trans rights issues or uh, things which are just like usually neglected. Um, obviously UNDP, um, UNHCR, all of those places and uh, Freedom House. So they look at um, democracy indicators, um, obviously Transparency International, which looks at um, corruption, um, Amnesty International, which looks at uh, state repression. Um, and I could go on and on. And then the newspapers that I was talking about was Al Jazeera, um, South China Morning Post, Der Spiegel, um, Deutsche Welle, Le Monde. Yeah, um, and, and so basically what I would do, this is actually a good way to think about this. If you want to read good international newspapers, a good criteria is to Google a random country and then find the most read English newspaper from there. And chances are that newspaper is also a good international newspaper. So if you find the most well-read like English newspaper in Germany or in France, chances are that you've also stumbled across a good international newspaper generally that doesn't talk about US or China that much. So if you do it for like, you know, Brazil or Nepal or uh, whichever country that you want to look at, you will just stumble across a very good newspaper. So that's a good trick to do it. Um, and then finally, uh, oh, thanks a lot. Like, uh, 
that's that's very helpful. Okay, I just got like hold some messages. That's that's fine. Um, great. So that's okay. Perfect. Okay, now people feel pressure to like send me more wholesome messages. I was just that was just a comment on what I just got. But um, the point is, I hope this was really helpful. Um, this is like a very small part of what uh, we ideally should cover overall. But like, I hope this helped. I tried to discuss things which were as fundamental as possible, and then hopefully we can get into the nitty gritties if we ever do this again. But thank you for having me. I